In the 8th century BC, when the Greek city-states were coming to power, a group of tribes occupied the hills above the Tiber in Italy. They were farmers, and their gods were the Numena. Faceless and formless spirits manifested in the powers of nature and the cycles of the seasons. But as they grew into an empire that stretched from the Atlantic to the Dead Sea, their gods would take on different forms. By the second century AD, 85,000 kilometers of paved roads carried their laws, currency, legions, and beliefs to over 400 nations. Their art, architecture, and engineering genius still generate wonder today. It was Horace, one of their most famous poets, who urged them, carpe diem, seize the day. And in their day, they would seize the territories, treasuries, and gods of other civilizations. They were the Romans. This is one of the best known symbols of Rome. Romulus, founder of the city, and Remus, his brother, being suckled by a she-wolf. But the she-wolf is Etruscan from about 500 BC. The twins were added 200 years later. The story of Rome and its gods begins elsewhere. adopted and adapted the customs and beliefs of the peoples they conquered. One of the most influential of these were the Etruscans. By 650 BC, Kaisre, now Cerveteri, was one of the richest towns in Europe, trading with Egypt and Venice. Like the Greeks, the Etruscans had a group of city-states, divided by politics, but bonded by religion. The Etruscans believed in an afterlife that resembled this life and housed their ancestors in a city of the dead. Thousands of tombs carved from the soft volcanic rock were arranged in a city-like plan. And it is among the dead we discover how the Etruscans lived. In 1827, frescoes were discovered in the Tomba dei Rilievi, as remarkable as any found in Greece. Painted on damp plaster, they revealed the Etruscan cult of the dead, similar to that of Egypt in the same era. Vases, pottery, and art objects were part of the furnishings the dead would need in the afterlife. But what of their gods? The Etruscans believed in the homely gods, the gods of the threshold and hearth. They also believed in the mighty gods, based on the Greek Zeus and Hera.
What the Etruscans took from the Greeks, the Romans took from the Etruscans. From the father god and mother goddess to the humble household gods, the Romans took it all when they defeated the Etruscans in 280 BC. The Forum, a center for trade and religious rituals, was the heart of Republican Rome. Roman religion encompassed and celebrated the mighty gods of nature and the everyday gods of domestic life. In the shadow of the Temple of Jupiter, the father god, bearer of thunderbolts, Vestal virgins kept the sacred flame alight, a symbol sacred to the goddess Vesta, who protected every Roman hearth and home. As the empire expanded, more and more kingdoms fell to Rome. The Romans brought their booty on the Via Flaminia over the Milvian Bridge. The Romans had mastered the arch. They would use it to span an empire and bring its riches home to Rome. The victorious generals rose to power and competed for the ultimate prize, to rule Rome itself. The Republic was under threat. Come at the hour, come at the man. The man who claimed descent from the goddess Venus and from the ancient Greek hero Aeneas crossed the Rubicon and captured his own capital. This man was Julius Caesar. He gave the city a new forum edged with monumental buildings long since gone. He took for himself the title Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of Rome. In 44 BC, when the senators murdered Caesar, they thought they were reclaiming solid Roman Republican values. In fact, they had swapped a dictator for an emperor. The reign of Augustus was the golden age of Rome. Art and architecture thrived. Marble temples and monuments were raised to honor gods borrowed from the Greeks. Zeus became Jupiter. Hera, the wife of Zeus, became Juno. Aphrodite became Venus. Poseidon, the sea god, became Neptune. The Roman public could bathe in the heated baths of Caracalia and flock to the Colosseum for entertainment. The Pantheon home of all the gods, became the religious heart of imperial Rome. Designed by Hadrian, it was the sanctuary of the Roman gods, dedicated to the emperor Augustus, who encouraged the idea of his own divinity. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, spread to the very edges of the empire. Caerleon in Wales was a walled outpost of the empire built in 75 AD and covering over 20 hectares. But the walls that kept the Welsh out kept the Romans in and within these walls they recreated Rome. Five and a half thousand legionaries lived in 60 barracks at Caerleon. Today, only the ruins of four remain, the only surviving legionary barracks in Europe. The Roman legions brought their gods with them to the far-flung regions of the empire. A Roman emperor might make a sacrifice to Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, to enlighten his rule. Far from the security of Rome, 
the legionaries of Kerleon would beg the favor of Mars, the god of war. But it wouldn't be Rome and home without an amphitheater. Why was it built outside the walls of the fortress? Is it possible that the only fighting the legionaries saw was between gladiators in this 6,000-seat arena? Caerleon was replicated all along the edges of the empire in forts and towns that held to Roman gods and Roman ways and protected Rome from the barbarians. All-powerful Rome was an empire in which the border between state and religion was becoming increasingly blurred. Why would it fear foreign gods? Emperor Hadrian's villa in Tivoli covered an area greater than that of the imperial center of Rome. Here, Hadrian created one of the greatest exhibitions of art and architecture, and most of it copied from the Greeks. The Romans regarded foreign gods as having power over the people who worshipped them. By bringing them to Rome and housing them in splendor, Hadrian hoped to transfer their power and their favor to the empire. His most ambitious project was the Canopus, a replica of the sanctuary of the Egyptian god Serapis in Alexandria. For this, he had a canal dug 119 meters long and lined with imported Egyptian statues, caryatids similar to those on the Acropolis. The statues of the Greek gods in Tivoli show how far the Roman gods had evolved from vague elemental noumena to take on human features and form. The Greeks gave faces to the Roman gods. On an island in a round pool, surrounded by columns, the man who ruled the lives of some 15 million subjects found solitude. In a state where the borders between religion and state had become inseparable, it was a short step from emperor to god. Here in the maritime theater, Hadrian could indulge his passions for painting, architecture, and for his lover, Antinous, who drowned in the Nile. By Hadrian's decree, he became the last Roman god. In Tivoli, Hadrian built a walled sanctuary for foreign gods and to house the art and architecture of conquered nations. But the threat to the Roman gods would come from the east, from a city gifted to Rome by the Greeks. According to the historian Aristiades, Ephesus was Asia's greatest center of trade and banking. It was an exotic city of marble streets and magnificent temples the envy of the ancient world. Founded in the 13th century BC by the Greek Androclus, it was bequeathed to the Romans in 133 BC. The Romans were content to allow the Ephesians pay homage to the Greek god Artemis, the Egyptian god Isis, or any of the other gods who had found followers in this cosmopolitan city. 
so long as they paid their taxes to Rome. Ephesus was dedicated to Artemis, the man-hating goddess of the moon, the woodlands, and women in childbirth. Her temple was one of the seven wonders of the world. A simple column remains. Marooned on a marsh, it's a fitting monument to the Greek architect Theodorus. Challenged to build on a marsh, he filled the foundations with coal, topped with leather. On this novel base, he raised a temple 115 metres long and 55 metres wide, the biggest marble temple in the world. The vision of Theodorus was awe-inspiring. 127 columns supported a massive wooden roof built with cedar beams. It was the pride of Ephesus. But Ephesus holds other architectural wonders. The library of Celsus in Ephesus was built in the second century AD by Achille as a monumental tomb for his father, Governor Polymenus. The architectural challenge was to squeeze it between two existing buildings. Achille created an optical illusion of height by arching the steps between the middle and the edge. In the same way, the columns in the center were larger than those at the sides, making the building look loftier than it was. The most beautiful Roman contribution to Ephesus was dedicated to the Emperor Hadrian in the second century AD. It was famous for the craftsmanship of its façade. Two columns with Corinthian capitals support a capstone decorated with a carving of Tyche, the goddess of fortune. The upper lintel holds a relief of Medusa, one of the three gorgons of Greek mythology whose appearance could turn men to stone. but it is the frieze around the upper lintel of the door that illustrates vividly the Roman influence on Greek Ephesus. Greek gods and Roman emperors share the frieze with mythological gods and heroes as equals. What threat could there be to the divine Roman emperor, the equal to Zeus and Apollo in the conquered city of Ephesus? But in this city of many gods, a new god was already being proclaimed in a theater that could hold 24,000 Ephesians. The speaker was Paul of Tarsus, champion of the new god, Jesus the Nazarene. The Romans would accommodate one god too many. 
this new religion with its one God was destined to take root in Rome and bring the pantheon of Roman gods to ruin. The 12th century church of San Clemente was built over the underground meeting places of the mystery cults in Rome. Meeting in secret beneath the crowded streets, there were those who longed for more than the state religion could offer. It was the defenders of the empire, the Roman legionaries, who brought the cult of Mithras from Persia to Rome in the first century BC. Part sun god, part hero, Mithras slew the bull whose blood renewed the earth and cleansed his followers who met here on the deepest level beneath San Clemente. In the fourth century AD, on the level above the Mithra sanctuary, another cult worshiped a man called Jesus, whose blood they claimed would renew the world and save his believers. But a state that required worship of the emperor and would house, honor, and accommodate a multitude of gods could never accept a religion that worshiped one god and no other. But even the legions of Rome and the walls of Hadrian could not hold forever against the tide of history and the spiritual quest of human hearts. The Roman Emperor Constantine, convinced that the new God Jesus had aided him in battle, converted to Christianity. Under Constantine, Christianity became the state religion. At street level, the magnificent church of San Clemente is a medieval monument to the religion that would spread to the furthest reaches of the empire and make Rome its religious capital. And what of the Roman gods? In some ways, they had become servants of the state and risen to prominence on the back of its military might. Rome would become a city of temples dedicated to the new god and a graveyard for the lost gods. <laughs> 